Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's just stand on our feet. Um, you can just feel the presence of the Lord this morning, amen? And um, we are just so excited to uh, delve into the word today. Um, God is doing something so amazing with the church, the local church, with the global church at large. And I don't know if you can sense or see what's going on. I feel like God is moving in a direction where he's bringing his church together and correcting them so that we can move forward towards the future. Amen. Um, and so uh, we're going to delve into this word. Um, let's give honor to Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> and um, let's give honor to uh, our pastor, Apostle G. Morris Coleman, our spiritual father. We love you. Rest. Rest being a God. <laughs> um, and we are, we are, we're so, we're so just, um, we're glad to be a part of this house. We're glad to be a part. I'm so glad to be a part of this house and glad to be a part of what God is doing here. Um, and so uh, let's. Before we get into the scripture, uh, just pull your phones out, your Bibles out. Um, we're, uh, as a church, um, we are a very demonstrative church. We believe in proactivity. And so um, we believe that just as we demonstrate or we're demonstrative in the, wor in the worship section, we're also demonstrative in the word. And so what that looks like is um, response, okay? Um, I grew up in the in the Pentecostal movement in the church, Pentecostal church. So I'm just not used to quiet church. And so it's, it's really important um, that we uh, just not be quiet today. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So um, I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them that we're going to preach this thing together. Tell it to the other person next to you and tell them we're going to preach this thing together. All right, so um, let's turn our phones, our Bibles, to Revelations chapter 2, 2 verse 5. Wait. Oh, yeah, we're preaching together. <laughs> uh, Revelations, can we pull that up on the um, screen? Revelation is 2, 2 through 5, um, and we're going to read from uh, the ESV version. Um, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Um, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word tonight, uh, this morning. We thank you, Lord, um, for what you're doing in the church at large. We pray that you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. All right. You guys ready to preach? Yeah. All right. Um, this, uh, this morning, we are delving into the book of Revelation. And for some people, Revelation can be an alarming book, can be somewhat scary to read, but I hope that by the end of this sermon, by the end of this talk, by the end of this dialogue that we engage in today, that you will see the beauty of this prophetic text, amen? And so, let's just jump into just the origin of Revelation. Revelation is written by a man named John. John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he's writing this letter to seven churches. So there are so many, there, there are different beliefs about who or what type or which John wrote this book. Some theologians believe that it was John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, who wrote the book of Revelations. Others believe that it was another John who was a messianic prophet of the time and who went around to different churches and taught about Jesus. We do not have the time to discuss or figure out which John it was, 
All we need to know is that John wrote the book. So John, John writes this book to the seven churches. Remember, he's on the Isle of Patmos. Patmos is a Greek island. Now, I want you to know that John is not on vacation. John is not getting a Manny and Petty. John is not at an exclusive, inexclusive, all-exclusive resort. Hello, praise the Lord. All-exclusive resort, taking his time. John is not resting. Actually, John is in jail in Patmos on a Greek island in Patmos. Why is John in jail? John is, hasn't killed anyone. John has not committed any moral uh, uh, disparity. John is in Patmos for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is happening now is that at the time there is a Roman emperor by the name of Domitian. And Domitian is intensifying the Christian persecution of this day. He makes a law. He writes a law and says, in order for you to exist in this country, in this town, in this region, you must declare Caesar as the ultimate divine being. It's to the point that you can even, you cannot go into the temple and talk about another God. You had to talk about Caesar. Imagine coming to church and not being able to talk about Jesus. Imagine walking into your local assembly and you are forced to talk about another God that you don't even believe in. And now John... He has to make a decision. He does not follow the law that comes against his faith. He chooses to follow what God has intended him to do. He chooses to preach Jesus. In spite of what the governmental law said, he goes into the temple and begins to preach about who? He preaches on Jesus. He's talking about the resurrected king. He's talking about the one that we love and adore. And as a result, they arrest him. They stone him. And on top of that, they take a hot cauldron of water and boil him in it. This is because he was preaching the name of Jesus. And for some of us, we get uncomfortable about talking about Jesus on our job, and we don't have the same ramifications that John did. John is being boiled, crispy, seafood boil. After he's being boiled, he's sent to the island of Patmos. It's crazy because... During this time of persecution, John gets a vision of Jesus, one of the most beautiful visions he's ever received in this time of his life. He gets a vision of Jesus. Isn't it crazy that God can use a time of persecution to reveal who he is in a deeper and a more beautiful way? Some of us, we pray, Lord, show yourself to me. And he gives us an opportunity to experience that through persecution. Jesus tells us that we will, be, we will suffer, we will be hated for his name's sake. And it's because of persecution we can see who God is. Nowadays, I, I really am more careful about my prayers because now I'm considering that if I want to experience God more, I have to understand that that comes with persecution. That comes with being hated on. That comes with being lied on. That comes with even losing family members and friends and connections that I have and people that I have to walk away from and opportunities and jobs and maybe have to turn away from things that seem enticing and inviting. I have to walk away from it because persecution is a pathway for revelation. Persecution is a pathway for Revelation. So John, John is talking about this Jesus. He goes into the vision of what he has in his letter, and he's not talking about lowly, humble baby Jesus. 
He's not talking about the Jesus that's come in the manger. He's talking about the triumphant Jesus, the glorious Jesus, the wonderful Jesus, the everlasting, beautiful, strong, ever-present Jesus. This is the Jesus that John is talking about. And John says something like this. He says, his eyes are like fire. His hair is like his feet is like, look at your neighbor and tell him, isn't he beautiful? This is the vision that John receives while he is on Patmos. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that he does not see a defeated Jesus in his defeated state, but he sees a victorious Jesus in his defeated, his defeated state. This is this is the Jesus that we come and sing about. This is the Jesus that we worship about every Sunday. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the first and he is the last. There is no one beside him, no one greater, no one bigger, no one stronger. This is a triumphant Jesus. I wish somebody would celebrate because you have a triumphant king. A triumphant Savior, a triumphant Jesus. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living and faithful and triumphant God. This is the Jesus that we sing about. This is why you cannot come to church any old type of way. This is why when you get through the door, you have to come with a praise. Because we're serving a triumphant God. How I grew up in the church was when before the praise and worship started, Mother Rickers would get up and she would sing, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow be heaven and earth. Uh, what a mighty God we, I wish you would catch on to this. What a mighty God. What a glorious God. What an ever-present God we serve. It's a triumphant God we're talking about. It's a triumphant Savior we are talking about. And so John is painting, he's painting the picture. His eyes are like fire. That means he has the ability to purify your soul with just one look. His feet are like brass. That means he can bear the weight of your burden and your sin. His hair is like, well, I don't got anything for that. It's just his hair is woolly. <laughs> Ain't nothing. It's nice, though. His hair is woolly. John says one more thing. He said his voice is like the sound of roaring waters. That means he has the ability to calm the storms in your life with just one word because the winds and the waves have to obey just the sound of his voice. He doesn't have to raise his hand. He just has to lift up a sound. And the winds and the waves will just obey to the sound of his voice. Some of you got healing because it was just the sound. Some of you just got deliverance just because it was just the sound. Some of you are here today just because of a sound. Some of you are alive today just because of a sound. It's the sound of warring waters. It's the sound of warring waters. This is what John is talking about. And so he sets up the picture so well. And then in chapter 2, he begins to address the church. The church that we're talking about today is, is the church of Ephesus. I want to explain to you, give you some background about who Ephesus is, what Ephesus is about, all of the dialogues. I didn't even say what I said. All the things, all the symbols in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a big, beautiful, influential city. The church was started by Paul. Paul did missionary work in Ephesus, and he started a church in Ephesus. Later, it was pastored by Aquila and Priscilla, and later it was pastored by Paul's protege, Timothy. It was said, it was said that even Mary... The mother of Jesus was attending the church at that time. 
imagine you showing up to church and Mary sitting next to you. I have a lot of questions. Like, Mary, like, you really didn't, like, pop Jesus in the mouth when he said, like, I'm going to go, like, leave you and do my father's business. Like, you didn't, you didn't do that. So Mary's attending the church. And you can imagine the personnel that's here at the church. It's like what we would consider our church to be today. So many people, so many people of influence, so many people of culture coming together to worship God every week. This is Ephesus. This is Ephesus. And John says, <laughs> John writes, to Eph- John is writing, writing the letter. And Jesus starts to say, hey, um, you guys are doing pretty amazing things. You guys are, are pre- you're doing a great job. Jesus says, you guys are, Testing the word of false apostles and false teachers. You hate wickedness. You endure. You persevere. You work hard. You guys are, you guys are doing a, a great job. But there's one thing that I have against you. There's one thing I have against you. He says, you've forgotten your first Love. You have forgotten your first love. This can be confusing because Ephesus is not, Ephesus is not an unhealthy church. Ephesus is not a terrible church. Ephesus is a pretty great church. They work hard. They persevere, they cast out devils, they heal the sick, they raise the dead, they take care of the orphans, they take care of the widows, they have conferences, they have prayer events, they have prophetic insight. And Revelation, they operate in the five-fold ministry. Paul started the church. Timothy was pastoring. The church, Timothy, worked signs and wonders in Ephesus. Ephesus is a really great church. But Jesus says, in all of the activity, you've forgotten about me. And I'm concerned with the church today. Because sometimes we confuse activity with proximity. We think that the more activities that we do, the closer we are to the Lord. And so we spend money and we spend resources and we do all of these things. And we we put together our nice flyers. We put together our nice tickets. we, we, We invite the people. We have service every week. We have food every week. And we've forgotten Jesus in all of this. Reality is that activity does not always equal proximity. You can be praying every week. And forget about Jesus. You can be casting out devils every week. And forget about Jesus. You can speak in tongues in seven different spiritual languages. And forget about Jesus. He says you've forgotten your first love. Jesus is not talking about the personnel, even though Mary's going to the church. He's not talking about what they're doing, the activities. He's coming for the why. Why do you get up in the morning and come to church? Why do you come out to the deliverance services? Why do you talk about the gospel? Why do you invite people to your church every Sunday? Is it because you just feel like you have an amazing church or is it because of the love of Jesus that draws you to bring people into the kingdom? Is it is that the reason? What is the why? Why do you do what you do? Because the why determines everything. The why determines everything. 
The why determines motivation. The why determines motive. The why determines even the time that you get up to come to church on a Sunday, even though when service starts at 11, you show up at 1230. I'm not coming for you. I'm just saying, what is the why? What, what is the why? What's the why? What's the why? What's the why? John, John is presenting this. He's like, why are you doing what you're doing? You've forgotten your first love. This makes me Think about the early days coming up in the church. And so I, I want to share a story with you. Um, Liana, you could uh, pull up the photo. All right. <laughs> so struggle praise. <laughs> Look where he's brought me from. Um, This is, I was 10 years old playing at my parents' church. This is the same year that I gave my heart to the Lord. Um, we went to a youth camp that year, and the pastor is preaching about the love of God. And I was 10 years old sitting in the chair and I felt like I just needed to run to the altar because I wanted to experience why, what this, this love that he was so passionate about. So I ran to the altar. I gave my heart to the Lord. And I remember when we came back from the youth camp, that Sunday night we had a service. And this was the picture that was taken from the Sunday night we came back from the youth camp. And when I was playing in my parents' church years before this. We started playing, I started playing at, at six years old in my parents' church. We didn't have anything else to do. Pray for us. It was me and my sister. Started playing in my parents' church at six years old. And at six to nine, playing at church was just fun for me. That was just like, oh, man, I get to play Hezekiah Walker <laughs> on a Sunday with the adults. Not the youth choir with the adults. This was, this was, this was my moment of my, my young life. I was like, this is going to be my moment to shine. Hezekiah Walker's going to get this work. <laughs> but when I turned 10, the songs that we were playing in church became prayers for me. And so we weren't just singing and playing songs just to have fun. It started to turn into an altar of worship for me because I was the, experiencing the love of God for the very first time. And I remember that night I was by the piano and our youth pastor got up and she was singing this song. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Trust me. Take my heart, Lord. Speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. And I'm playing the song. And what the song became a prayer. And as tears started to roll down my face, I started to re- dedicate my full life to the Lord. It wasn't about just coming to play songs in church. It was that I just wanted to be used by God. I just wanted to be open to whatever he wanted me to do. If he wanted me to go down the street and talk to that man down the street, I was willing to do that. If he wanted me to come to church early and pray, I was willing to do that. But somewhere along the way, that desire faded. Prayers started turning to complaints. Complaints started turning into bitterness. Bitterness turned into anger. Anger turned into resentment. And resentment turned into me walking away from the faith. Because I forgot 
first love. I wonder, I wonder where or when was the moment that you forgot your first love? When was the moment that you forgot about the time you got saved and all you wanted to do was come to church? When was the moment that you forgot about when, when God rescued you out of that bad relationship and you came to church the next day with your hands lifted? When was the moment that you forgot about those times? When did you forget your first love? Because to be honest, it's hard to track in real time. Because we're, we're, we'll go on autopilot, we'll go through the motions, we'll do the things, we'll do the things that church people do, we'll speak in tongues, we'll, we'll shout, we'll holler, and we'll forget about the time that we came from youth camp and got saved. We forget about the time that that mother prayed for us while we were going through depression. We forget about the time where we walked through the doors for the first time and we felt the freedom of God for the first time. We forget. We forget. We forget. You take the picture off. <laughs> Jesus says to them, You've forgotten your first love. This is what I need you to do. I need you to remember the heights from which you've fallen. Remember where you came from. Because sometimes we forget. This picture that I had and shared with you was not the first time that God has rescued me from, from something. I remember when I was 20 years old, went through a serious transition in my life, bad relationship, crying, sad, depressed. And I remember going to church every Wednesday and every Tuesday for prayer meeting. And I told the Lord, Lord, if you can get me out of this bed, I promise I won't kill myself today. Lord, if you could just give me the strength to put on my socks, I won't take these pills today. So Monday through Tuesday, I would drink and get high. I would lay in the bed. And Wednesday and Thursday, I would pray, Lord, get me out of this bed so I don't kill myself. And we would go to the city in these prayer meetings. And we would play and sing before the Lord. And it was in those moments the Holy Spirit started to minister to me. And show me how much I was loved. Show me how much I was valued. He sent people in my life to walk me through deliverance. And so within the year, when my prayer was, Lord, get me out of the bed so I don't kill myself. A year later, I was thanking the Lord that I didn't kill myself. Yeah. I didn't take my life. I didn't. Because the Lord sent people in my life. And every now and again, when I come to church, I have to go back to the heights in which I've fallen. So I don't forget my love and desire for God. That's the power of the testimony. That's the power of the testimony. It's not just for you to tell it, but it's for also for you to give yourself a reminder. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord did last year. Look what the Lord did two years ago. Look what the Lord did three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. Look what the Lord has done. I have to remind myself what he did. 
I have to remind myself of when I was in the bed. I have to remind myself when we and Mika were in the hospital with the boy and they were telling us that the boy was not going to live and they were telling us that the boy was not going to be able to walk and they were telling us that the boy was not able to talk. But we have a three-year-old boy running a... We have a three-year-old boy running around the church. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. If you just take a moment to remember what the Lord has done. You didn't lose your mind because he saved you. Just remember. Just remember. Just remember. Just remember. Just remember. Just remember, just remember, just remember, just remember, just remember. Remember the time that you were almost going to die and he saved you? You are not an accident. You're alive. This is not a mistake. You're alive. This is not a problem. Lord, I thank you. That you did not let me die in my sin. I thank you, God, that you didn't let me die in my sin. I know I was crazy, but you did not let me die in my sin. I know I was acting up, but you didn't let me die in my sin. I know I was doing wrong, but you did not let me die in my sin. I did it on purpose, but you did not let me die. I said wrong things, but you did not let me die in my sin. That ought to evoke some praise. That ought to evoke worship. That should provoke praise. That should provoke worship. That should provoke praise. That should provoke worship. Oh, say, Tabat Seke. That should provoke praise. I didn't die. I didn't die. I did not die. I did not die. And the crazy part is I've seen other people die from the same thing. I didn't die in my sin. I really feel the prophetic unction of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have children, and I hear the Lord saying, this is a reminder for you. Your children are a reminder of the testimony of Jesus. You did not die. The child didn't die. Glory. Glory. He said to remember the heights in which you've fallen. You have to take time to remember. You have to take time to remember. He says, second thing he says is to repent and do the things that you first were doing. For me, that was going back to the moments of my youth camp. What we would do is we would play and sing to God for hours and hours. In the prayer meeting that I was telling you about, we sing for hours and hours. And what that did for me 
was a develop was was it developed a hunger and a desire for the presence of God. I started to realize that I really couldn't live my life without God's presence. I could not. I really couldn't. And when I tried to, it was a complete mess. So for me, every now and again, I have to go back to the piano and sing, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Or sometimes I would have to go back to the memories that I had when I was growing up in Greater Harvest Church of God in Christ. And Mother Vickers would say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory. Yes, Lord. Shate kebasoto. Yes, Lord. Glory. Woo! Yes, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, glory, have your way, oh Lord, have your way, have your way, have your way. Whatever you want to do, Lord, have your way. However you want to move, Lord, have your way. I have to go back to the heights from which I've fallen. I have to do the things that I did at first. But he doesn't stop there. He says to repent. Repent seems like an offensive word today because it could seem like your just life is a wreck. It's not the case. It's an invitation to come back to the Father. It's an invitation to come back to the Father. It's an invitation to come back to the Father. But it's also an invitation to turn away from the sin that possesses us. If we're honest, sometimes we really don't want to repent because we love what we're doing so much. If we're honest, we don't want to turn away because what we're doing is enjoyable. And the reality is is that if we turn away from this temporary pleasure, we will be receiving an eternal pleasure. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, you can do all the things. You have all the activities. You can be so active. You can, you can preach, you can prophesy, you can pray, you can, you can create activities, you can create conferences. But you can be far from God. You can be far from God. 